it's wonderful to be speaking to directors of companies and people interested in the well-being of South Africa. Thank you very much for this invite. Before I go any further, I need those, the audience, to understand the ethos of Gift for the Givers. I didn't get up one morning and say, let me form an organization, see what the needs are, draw a list of founding principles, get a group of people. No, it never happened like that. Gift for the Givers has a spiritual basis, a spiritual teacher who commanded the formation of the organization. This happened in, uh, in Turkey on the 6th of August, 1992. I met a spiritual teacher the year before in Turkey. I was back in 1992 at 10 p.m. on a Thursday night, the 6th of August. The spiritual teacher was sitting in the corner of the room. I was in the other corner. He makes eye contact with me and eye contact heavenwards. And then in fluent Turkish, I don't understand a word of Turkish, but I understood every single word that he said. He tells me, my son, I'm not asking you. I'm instructing you to form an organization. In Arabic, the name will be Wakful Wakifin. Translated, it means gift of the givers. You will serve all people of all races, all religions, all colors, all classes, all cultures of any geographical location and of any political affiliation. But you will serve them unconditionally. You will expect nothing in return, not even a thank you. This is an instruction for you for the rest of your life. And remember, my son, that whatever you do is done through you and not by you. This was a spiritual connection. I told you I don't speak a word of English or Turkish, but I understood every word of Turkish he said. At some point I asked him, I said, teacher, how is it that when you speak Turkish, I understand? And when other people speak Turkish, I don't understand. He said, my son, when the hearts connect and the souls connect, the words become understandable. I told him, you gave me this instruction. What does it mean? What am I supposed to do? I'm a general practitioner in private practice. I have three surgeries in a place called Peter Marisburg in South Africa. Am I supposed to do what you want me to do in weekends, public holidays, after holidays, school holidays, when and what? He told me one line, you will know. For 30 years, I do know what to do, how to do, when to do, what not to do. The moment I walked out of the place that same night, by inspiration it came to me, respond to the civil war in Bosnia. And we took in 32 containers of aid in August 92, another eight containers in November 92. And in 93, we designed and delivered the world's first containerized mobile hospital, a product of South African technology, built in Pretoria, the first of its kind in the world, and took it from Africa into Europe. Those three events guided me that gift of the givers in essence was going to be a disaster response and intervention agency. Everything that we do after that will be around disasters, disasters being the key focus. We have 21 different types of projects, not 21 projects, 21 different categories of projects, and each category has subcategories. We started off with international disaster we then built from tents, blankets, food and medicines. We took in primary health care teams, trauma teams, post-op rehab teams, trauma counselors, search and rescue teams, took in snuffed, snuffed dogs, specialized equipment for medical and search and rescue, build hospitals, support agriculture, build homes, provide, provide tents, blankets and medicines. And by that point, we were the most complete disaster agency in the world. No other agency in the world does all of, all of the above at the same time. We're the only guys in the world that do that. As the years passed on, you know, we, we, uh, in November 2016, I cut international marketing, not the projects, only the marketing, because the media locally were focusing too much on international projects and didn't know what was happening locally. And the country needed to know what was happening locally. In 2017 came the first big local intervention. That was the Nizana fire. At that point, the country then understood 
the capability of gift receivers. We sent in two lady managers who controlled the distribution and packaging of 20,000 food parcels. Check a shop right, gave us a car park in Nazareth to do that. The local people came with buckies and forklifts to help offload the big trucks that were coming in. The local people got together and assisted our teams that managed all of the local people to do those food parcels, hygiene packs, distribute the blankets, sanitary pads and diapers. We then sent support for the firefighters. We've provided meals for the firefighters twice a day for the entire period. We brought in specialized medical personnel and advanced life support ambulances and advanced life support paramedic teams to move patients from Nice Hospital to the other hospitals. We then people then asked and said, look, the animals, our pets are hungry. So we brought in pet food for cats and for dogs. And then somebody came and said the elephant in Elephant Park is hungry. The wild elements in a bush are hungry. The cows and the sheep are hungry because there was a drought here before this big fire came. And the drought is still on right now. Provided fodder for all those categories. And then a man walked in and said, I need sugar. And I said, didn't you get sugar? He said, no. I didn't get, but it's not for me. So I said, who's it for? He said, it's for the bees. And I was stunned. I was shocked about bees eating sugar. On further explanation, he said, because of the drought, the, the, the plants that the bees eat on, survive on, were destroyed. The fire destroyed 300 beehives. Each beehive holds 75,000 to 80,000 bees, which means that 22 million of the Cape honeybee was destroyed. He needed sugar because there was no plants and the pollen nectar substitute was far too expensive. We funded the new 300 new hives, money to regrow the plants, money for sugar, or we provided the sugar and money for the nectar substitute. That project is now fully functional. It has been a source of research and many, many school and university students have gone there to understand bees. The Cape honeybee is the most versatile in the world. It is deployed and deployed, which means that if the honeybee dies, the queen bee dies, the other bees can remanufacture a new queen bee. That's how versatile and resilient that bee is. It had to be saved at any cost. In the same year, we intervened in Sutherland. The drought there was killing the sheep count. 440,000, the sheep count eventually dropped to 31,000. You couldn't afford to lose those merino sheep, one of the best sheep in the world. You couldn't bring any other sheep, they won't survive. The Marino sheep had developed an environmental intelligence, knowing which plants to eat and which ones not to eat to survive. We took in millions of rands of fodder and truckloads of support. And eventually in January this year, we supported our team members, Yad and Sabal Fasaki, who put up a special pellet producing machine. It was fortified with nutrition at a very low cost, the cheapest in the country that can be provided to the farmers so they could feed their sheep, not in the open field, but in an underground, in an undercover controlled warehouse where animals will not attack the sheep. For the first time since 2017, the sheep count is starting to rise. Farmers are having more sheep to sell. They're having more wool to sell. Their number, numbers are multiplying and they're starting to take on more labor. It's part of our responsibility. We try to expand the reach and benefit the country in many ways. In the same year, 2017, the disaster management called us in Beaufort West. Water, the, the water system had collapsed. There was no water. Nobody could find water. We sent in our geologist, Dr. Khidian Kodawal, and we found water to drill seven boreholes to push the water through the Khamka Dam, down with gravity, into the city, into the reservoirs, and support the city. We got involved in day zero in Cape Town in 2018. Brought in 300 containers of water in, of, of 300 containers of water from Joburg and Devon by ship and by road. We drill boreholes in Cape Town and people need to understand Cape Town is not Western Cape. It's part of the Western Cape. It's not the only part of Western Cape. The, the, lots of suburbs on the outside, a lot of rural areas required support in terms of water and drilling of boreholes. We did that. In 2019 came our intervention in Makanda and we're still there and we're there again to, in, in this month. As we know, the, the, the dam levels have dropped substantially in Kabeha, and it's, it's in a serious pro problem right now in the Eastern Cape. We got involved in Makanda, drilled 15 boreholes, including three in the university, seven in Wainek, where the water plant is, 
at SAPS, at, at, at the Settlers Monument where they have all the conferences, and also with the SPCA. We put in those boreholes, we put in filtration plants, over a million rand worth of filtration plants, put in pipelines to send in water to the different areas, and use our boreholes to load water tankers to support, support different areas in Makanda. We've been doing that since 2019 and in other parts of Eastern Cape. Came 2020, COVID hit in a big way. And to get into government hospitals to provide services, it's very, very difficult. Too much of bureaucracy, too much of red tape, but we broke through. No paperwork, nothing in writing, no request. We delivered essential items for COVID to 210 hospitals nationwide. PPEs, pulse oximeters, non-contact thermometers, scrubs, high flow nasal oxygen machines, CPAP machines, video laryngoscopes, medical supplies. We, we upgraded hospitals, put in beds, put in mattresses and blankets and linen. We supported the payment of paramedic staff to assist in hospitals because the healthcare workers' numbers were dropping, they were dying, and hospitals needed support. They were flooded and, and could not manage the patient count. We put in 10 teams of, to assist testing, and we had mobile teams throughout the country, even testing sports teams, rugby teams, soccer teams, cricket teams, and doing mobile testing for, for schools, universities, all over. We had teams dedicated to that. And as we were busy with that, when the lockdown came, the first real challenge of hunger became visible in the Eastern Cape. In June 2020, we were in a place called Pedi, and we saw the people who came for the first food parcels in that area. And my mother came and said, thank you very much for the food parcel. Please speak to my children. They are, they will tell you the taste of every plant in this area. For the last three months for survival, they've been eating plants. That is the story throughout the Eastern Cape. The hunger expands throughout the country. Children and adults have been eating tortoises, lizards, even cats to survive. Our teams witnessed at the dump sites. When the dump trucks came, children ran to the dump site to scavenge and find whatever they could find to eat. Thin, malnourished, hungry. They would, she would, we would see them putting their fingers in a peanut butter bottle, turning it around, with their fingers inside, scooping up and eating whatever little grams there were in there. We saw them eating from a jam tin, serrated jam tin, which carries infection and the danger of, of getting cut, but they were desperate. We then supported 100 soup kitchens, besides delivering 1.2 million food parcels. And at the soup kitchens itself, children would come to the front of the queue, and some of them would say, please, I won't take too much. Can you give me some for my father, my mother, my brother, and my sister? They are hungry at home. I won't eat too much. Children became martyrs. They sacrificed so the family, for family members could eat. These are the qualities that South Africans need. The quality of selfless service, of children giving, leading the example, not looting, not corrupt, not greedy, sharing, having golden heart so that others can survive. Our country needs four essential principles, spirituality, morality, values, and ethics. We say government is corrupt, but corruption starts from the corporates. We need to own that fact and understand that. We have people within our systems that are part of the corruption, that, that tempt people with higher money and kickbacks, that inflate prices. In the end, we all suffer. Our families, our children, our extended families, grandchildren, and the future generation. If the country is so totally destroyed, none of us are going to benefit. It's time we take this seriously and change circumstances around. And at the same, in the same breath, I must give all credit to corporates. Because for the first time in 2020, when the pandemic came, corporate CEOs started overriding the CSI. To be blunt, most of the corporate CSIs don't have a clue what's going on in the country. They are appointed to do some small projects, take the register, get the BE certificate, get a tax certificate, do some PR, get some publicity and some coverage. But you don't address the real needs of the country. So when the CEO started calling and said, what can we do? How can we save the country? That's true leadership. 
And from that day up to today, the CEOs from all the top corporate companies in the country have been talking to us and making the interventions and speeding up processes so there's no bureaucracy and getting things done. We needed to upgrade hospitals. We needed to get food parcels to the people. We needed to drill more balls to provide water. And in that way, the response has been phenomenal. Then came the July unrest in KZN in 2021. There was an even bigger awareness, a bigger need, a bigger haste from corporate companies. All of them said, came the same question. Is there hope for the country? Can South Africa be saved? What can we do? Not, I need to run away. I need to leave the country. I need to take my money and I need to pull out. No, they came with a different mindset. Yes, some people want to leave, but others mostly said, we want to stay here. How do we fix the situation? And the support came even bigger. That wasn't a political address. That wasn't rioting. That wasn't about hunger. If it was about hunger, Eastern Cape would have burned first because hunger in Eastern Cape is endemic. Right now, as we speak, in the hospitals in Eastern Cape, children are dying of malnutrition. We partnered the government to support them with, mal with support for malnutrition, to provide fortified items of food, of a peanut butter paste, and a product called Genesis. A Norwegian company has just sponsored us 15 containers of the enriched nutritional peanut paste, at which, which is valued just over 21 million rand. And a special thank you to all the corporates for the cash funding and items in kind, food items coming in, so that we can make a difference to the lives of the people. And that brings us to the main point. Why is there unrest? Is it because of hunger? Is it because of the political the, uh, chaos within the, the ruling parties? Is it because there's a huge gap between the rich and the poor? Is it, people, is it because the poor people want to have the things the rich people have? No. Yes, this play a, a, a part of it. But the most important part of all of this is that when people have no dignity, when everything is lost, when they are totally humiliated, when they see no hope, then there's no limit to what a person can do in that situation. When the child cannot get a transport to the hospital, cannot get medical care, dies from a condition that's treatable, should have never have happened, is hungry, falls down a pet latrine in the school, does not have proper teaching and education, does not have proper incentive or, or support from teachers or from any other part of the country, people lose hope. If corporates want to make a difference, if South Africans want to make a difference, this is the time. It is time to give hope. It is time to be spiritual, to have spirituality, morality, values, and ethics. It's not only about investing through NGOs. It is about changing our own personality and our own character. Let's help in every way. And this is where the most important intervention needs to take place. Unfortunately, we can see that all the corporates have been asking that question. People have been asking that question, how do we help and how do we save the country? We have, can create jobs in the construction industry. Textiles need to be brought back to South Africa. We need to cut out, you know, importing from China. TFG, Mr. Price and Woolworths are now looking at an expanded textile program in South Africa. We need to bring back the leather industry and jobs can be created in a huge way. The building construction industry, jobs can be created in an important way. And how do we make all this happen? We need to, and people are scared to say, how to intervene, how to engage government. We lose the tenders, we lose the contracts. It's important for us to make the statement, and we make that statement boldly, repeatedly, and for quite some time now. The country does not belong to the government. The country belongs to me, you and 60 million South Africans. And it is our responsibility to fix the country ourselves. We need to understand the government itself, 7.2 million people's taxes cannot serve 60 million people. Whilst there is government and corruption, they, sorry, whilst there's corruption in government, everyone in government is not corrupt. Everyone is not a bad person. There are lots of good people in government wanting to do things a good way. They are blocked, they are obstructed, a lot of them don't have the skills how to do that. But we can hold hands collectively as a country and do it. Right now is a problem. Fix the potholes ourselves, as many people are starting to do through South Africa. Fix the mergers ourselves. Fix pipes ourselves. People are providing, they're opening their bowls and providing water to come places inside Durban where there's a water crisis right now. South Africans are coming to the party. And we each keep coming to the party. People, teachers are saying, I'm retired. I'll offer free tuition. That's the kind of Ubuntu that we require in our country 
where people can make things happen at a low cost or for free or to share. And if we do that collectively, we will change our country because there is a mindset, there is a narrative change where people want to do something to save the country. Yes, make money. Nobody's stopping you from making money. But do it the right way, the honest way, give better salaries. And if we can, provide medical aid programs for all our staff as far as possible. We are engaging the medical aids to see if they, if they can provide packages at a cheaper price so that more people can fall into the system of medical aids and private health care. And those who can't be part of that system, collectively as the country, as corporates, as government, as ordinary people, as those who are earning high salaries, let's, uh, let us upgrade the healthcare system, spend on more personnel, provide salaries for nurses, for registrars, for interns, for a few years until our financial situation within the government corrects itself. We lost too much money with state capture, for currency fluctuation, for COVID-19, for the loss of trade and economic collapse over, over the last two or three years. It can get fixed up. It just needs our support for the next two or three years. I think I've covered all the essential aspects important for us to rebuild our country. Thank you very much.